Welcome to the McQuistian program, talking about things that matter with people who care. Hi, I'm Vince Pacenti, your co-host, and today we're going to discuss the kinds of trends that are happening, the trends that are in front of us, and the trends that will reshape our future. And so for us to really truly understand how this is going to impact us, we've brought in an expert who can help us with the demographic changes, the shifts in uh, gender uh, responsibility, to be able to understand the wealth demographics in terms of uh, urbanization. And as we go through this, we want to be able to dive in deep and understand how that will impact us at an inflection point of 2030. And to introduce our guest, we have Mr. Jim Falk. Thank you so much, Vince. It's good to see you. And you are right. We certainly have the right expert for this discussion. A native of Spain, Mauro Gullen is the author of 2030, How Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Reshape the Future of Everything. Published in 2020, this book was an immediate Wall Street Journal bestseller and was also named by the Financial Times as a book of the year. Having spent nearly two decades as a professor of management at the Wharton School, Morrow is now based in Cambridge, England, where he is the dean of the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School, a position he assumed earlier this year. And incidentally, the school is considered one of the top 10 in the world. His online courses on Coursera, and imagine this, this course that he taught attracted more than 100,000 participants, just astonishing. A Yale-trained sociologist, Morrow is known for his ability to identify and link critical trends that will undoubtedly reshape our society as well as you. Welcome. It's so great to have you with us today. Oh, thank you, Jim, for your wonderful introduction, and thank you, Vince, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, Vince and I have both read your book, and one of the things that struck me is there are numerous trends that you could have identified. How did you decide on the ones that you did, and why 10 years? Why not five years? Yeah, those are great questions. And look, I focused on population trends, economic trends, and technological trends, uh, and maybe you know to the exclusion of geopolitical trends and so on and so forth because I wanted to give people a sense as to where consumer markets and financial markets were headed, uh, and also help people make decisions, whether uh, they are um, you know, savers or investors, or whether they are workers at companies, uh, people who are trying to launch a business. So I decided to focus on three types of trends that I thought had an immediate impact on the kinds of decisions that people need to make uh, as uh, savers, as investors, as entrepreneurs, as workers or employees, as managers, and so on. And then why 10 years? Well, because um, as I was crunching the numbers and I spent uh, maybe six or seven years doing research on the book before publishing it, I realized that uh, the situation was going to be very, very different by the year 2030. Um, and so that's why I decided to adopt the 10 year time horizon because I thought if I describe the world in 2030, which is 10 years roughly speaking from its publication date, as you mentioned in 2020, um, then I can give people a sense as to how much the world is going to change, which is the main message in the book, and of course, how to prepare for it. Uh, tell us about uh, what we're really going to be seeing in so far as demographic trends in the United States, and then why don't you go ahead and take it from, say, China or another country that you wish? Well, population trends are really, really important to, for us to keep in mind because um, over the long run, right, 20, 30 years down the road, they will change everything. Uh, so for the last uh, few decades, we have seen a decline in the number of babies being born. Uh, this has been going on everywhere in the world, including the poorest parts of the world. It has certainly been going on in the United States. That's why we refer to the baby boom generation uh, when uh, families uh, used to have uh, in the United States on average three or four kids. Uh, but today the situation is very, very different. Uh, we're actually below replacement, below two kids. So that's one of the key population trends. The other really important population trend is how long do those babies who are being born, um, are they expected to live? That's called life expectancy. And as you know, that has been growing. Uh, but these two things, the decline in fertility, the decline in number of babies, and the growing life expectancy are going to create a very different situation, roughly speaking, by the year 2030. Um, in the United States, uh, we're going to see a gradual decline in the population, except that, of course, we have high immigration, and that is compensating for it. 
In other parts of the world where immigration is not that important and actually the number of babies has declined even faster, I'm talking about Japan, about China, about South Korea, about Europe, what we're going to see is a drastic decline in terms of the population um, uh, that those parts of the world have as a percentage of the world's total, and even in absolute terms, right? And then the last group of countries, of course, are places like Sub-Saharan Africa or parts of the Middle East or parts of South Asia, where fertility is declining, the number of babies is declining, but uh, has declined from a very large, high level, from six or seven children per woman on average, right? And so um, we're still seeing over there families that have on average three or four kids. So there's still a lot of population growth. And you know what? The other really interesting thing is that the life expectancy of those babies being born in the poorest parts of the world is actually increasing much faster from a very low level, but increasing much faster because, you know, uh, is the low hanging fruit, right? When you first introduce better nutrition, better public health measures, vaccines, and so on and so forth, then you get this big bump in life expectancy. So all of these things are going to create a dramatic reconfiguration of population in the world, away from East Asia and Europe, and more towards South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. The United States, somewhere in between, Latin America, somewhere in between, no big dramatic changes here, uh, but it's still uh, you know, a slightly downward trend in terms of population. So when we start to think about these trends, you can, you've come up with a term that was new to me as lateral thinking. Could you dive in a bit about what that means and how we can interpret trends for our own perspectives? So lateral thinking is all about connecting the dots, okay? So in other words, uh, we should never just take one of these trends at a time and try to extract conclusions. The whole point of the book, the whole point of my analysis is that we need to actually integrate all of the trends, see how they converge on one another to produce a very different situation. So I always use as an example of lateral thinking um, the following one, which is what, what, what is it about the number of babies in China that may have something to do with interest rates in the United States, right? When you consider those two things, uh, you know, you, you, you wonder, uh, what's the connection? How, how, you know, how is it possible that the number of babies in China may have something to do with how much I pay for my mortgage uh, in Ohio, right? And uh, the chain of, um, uh, the logical chain is actually very simple. Um, so China, as you know, has a very high savings rate. People in China save a lot of money, right? Uh, and um, now that um, because of the one-child policy and because of the overall decline in the number of babies, now they have a rapidly aging population. Very soon they're going to have 35% of their population above the age of 60. Now when you have such a big proportion of the population above the age of 60, that means that people start saving less because they're using their savings during retirement. So savings in China are going to be coming down as a result of these demographic changes. And then guess what? They're not going to be sending as many savings to other parts of the world, right? Because what China has been doing for the last 30 years, as you know, is purchasing government bonds here in the United States, treasuries, right? So if there's a, few, if there's a smaller amount of savings coming out of China uh, towards places like the United States, then we're going to have a harder time financing our debt. And therefore, long term, so I'm not talking about next year or two years uh, uh, from today. I'm talking about maybe 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road. We're going to have a harder time funding our deficits. And therefore, there will be somewhat upward pressure on interest rates here in the United States just because of the fact that there's fewer babies in some of those countries in the world, especially China, that uh, have been funding our indulgence, in other words. One of the things that you highlight is that women are taking a much uh, larger role, one uh, in corporations, but also more women are attending college than, than males. And I'm wondering, as a follow-on to that, how has COVID perhaps changed some of your conclusions? Yeah, so one of the most important uh, aspects of change these days, Jim, is what's going on with women. As you said, there's more women in the United States attending college than men. And according to the U.S. Bureau of the Census, um, in 39% of American households, women, uh, the woman makes more money than the man, right? And by the year 2030, the U.S. government predicts that it will be about half of American households where women will make more money than men. Now, the pandemic, unfortunately, has been a setback for women, especially in the United States. We saw during the early months uh, that about two and a half million American women quit their jobs. They uh, withdrew from the labor market because they couldn't 
uh, you know, when, if you remember, uh, children couldn't go to school, they couldn't, um, you know, pay attention to their children at home and at the same time work outside of the household. And that, of course, was the consequence itself of uh, the unequal division of labor within the household that we have mothers actually spending more time taking care of household tasks, including taking care of the children, than uh, fathers, even when they work outside of the household. So that was a setback. But uh, let's not forget, there's so many other trends that the pandemic has accelerated, trends that I describe in the book. For example, the decline in the number of babies, because young couples prefer to postpone having babies when they see so much uncertainty. Or I think the best example is the adoption of technology. Uh, so the adoption of technology has been greatly accelerated by the pandemic, right? Uh, at, at work, um, uh, when, we, when it comes to learning, when it comes to shopping, and so on and so forth. So I think the pandemic, for the most part, has accelerated trends. But it's true that there's been some setbacks. And unfortunately, one of them has been involving women. And one of the things that you said with a little bit of humor is that people are staying home watching Netflix and instead of having babies. Well, that's right. I mean, the thing is, people were expecting uh, families to have more babies or couples to have more babies because they would be spending more time at home. But, you know, whenever there is economic uncertainty, and this pandemic has triggered a big wave of economic uncertainty, whenever people fear that they may be losing their jobs or they actually lose their jobs, which is, if you remember what happened during the uh, early phase of uh, lockdown in the pandemic, uh, both in Europe and the United States, then people put on hold important decisions. And one of the most important decisions that we make in life is to have a baby. So in other words, people have been postponing. And as a result of that postponing, we've seen a further decline in the fertility rate. About 300,000 fewer, 300, fewer babies were born in the United States in the year 2020 because of the pandemic. So, Maro, in, in the spirit of lateral thinking, we couple that with the aging population and an increase in the middle class and then uh, inflation. So I'm, I'm trying to think laterally how those all interact. Can you kind of decode that for us? Well, inflation, as you know, is uh, something that has emerged as an important uh, factor over the last, I would say, three or four months. So I would say since the summer of 2021. And so essentially, as you know, it's been driven by a number of things. One is, of course, problems with uh, global supply chains because of the disruptions of the pandemic. Uh, which, by the way, started in supply chains before the pandemic with um, uh, the trade wars, right? And with other problems in the global trading system. And then on top of that, we have a very tight labor market because as uh, I was commenting earlier, many people have withdrawn from the labor market. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, there's been, uh, I think, a, a good run in the uh, stock market. So there are bubbles building up, right? And that means more money available. People are chasing fewer goods because of supply chain problems. So you get inflation. And um, I don't think we should be too worried about inflation, but this is adding, adding another preoccupation, even if, um, you know, I don't personally believe it's going to be, um, uh, uh, you know, let's say three or four years from now, a major issue. Now, how does that interact with the middle class? Well, the middle class, as you know, in Europe and the United States has been stagnant for the last 20 or 30 years. But fortunately, the one problem that the middle class didn't have over the last 20 or 30 years in the US and Europe was inflation, because inflation, as you know, has been very, very low for the last 20 or 30 years. So on top of everything else that is going on, uh, technological change, competition from other countries, if on top of that, now we have inflation, which tends to hurt the middle class more so than other uh, groups of, uh, of society, then that is, uh, that's not good news, obviously. And uh, the reason why it tends to hurt the middle class more so is because the middle class has savings, but the middle class doesn't have enough savings to be able to, you know, do sophisticated uh, finance, right? Like that really rich people can do and move their money around uh, the world. Uh, the middle class suffers more from inflation uh, because a greater percentage of their income goes into consumption and also because their savings get undermined as a result of uh, inflation. You know, I wonder if, and, and I wish we had time to go in detail over every one of the trends, but one that really struck me was cryptocurrency. And I think the title in your book of the chapter was more currencies than, than countries. Uh, and are we going to see a point where bank banks that we see are just going to be no longer, they'll be obsolete? <laughs> Well, um, let me handle first the issue of cryptocurrencies. I think uh, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. The question is whether they will become dominant or not. I think what we're going to see is that um, we're going to have uh, 
uh, as consumers, as uh, savers, options to use cryptocurrencies. But I actually believe that the dollar, the renminbi, the euro, the yen, the, the pound sterling will continue to be the most important currencies in the world. And I say this because at the end of the day, uh, people will realize that cryptocurrencies can be very risky, whereas government currencies uh, offer more security. But also because I believe that the central banks in Europe, the European Central Bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve, and so on, uh, sooner or later, they're going to issue, they're going to launch their own digital currencies. So a digital dollar, a digital euro. So with all of the benefits of crypto, but at the same time, the guarantee of uh, the government behind it. So crypto will, uh, uh, private cryptocurrencies, I think, uh, will be widely used, um, but not uh, dominant in the, in, the, in the global economy. Uh, so, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Well, Jim. I was going to say, what, what are the pros and cons of cryptocurrency briefly? Well, right now, the problem with uh, cryptocurrency is that the price fluctuates quite a bit, right? So it's volatility. Um, so uh, the other problem is that, that they're not widely accepted as a form of payment. There's still very few merchants, right? Very few people are willing to accept uh, cryptocurrencies. Very few governments in the world are willing to accept cryptocurrency, for example, to pay for taxes. Uh, only the government of El Salvador. Now, El Salvador is not precisely the best functioning co economy in the world. I mean, they're doing this because they want to attract capital of whatever kind, right? Here in the United States, there was one state about four years ago which for a few months accepted cryptocurrency in payment of taxes. And that was Ohio. But after a few months, they uh, discontinued that uh, possibility. They, they no longer accepted crypto in payment of taxes. So the problem is that uh, cryptocurrency is not widely accepted. Uh, we're far away from that. And then secondly, so volatile that as an asset class, right, as a store of value, uh, it's also very risky. So uh, there are people who are putting money into cryptocurrency and one day goes up and then another day comes down. I mean, Bitcoin, which is uh, perhaps the most uh, famous one, you know, goes up in value one year by 40% and another year goes down in value by 25%. And so this volatility, I think, is inimical to cryptocurrency as an asset class. That's one problem. And the second problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's not widely accepted as a form of payment. Mauro, when, when it comes to trends, have we missed any? And I keep thinking about the uh, global warming and urbanization and how just <laughs> there's a lot of factors there that are external. What, what's the impact of um, global warming? Global warming is a very, very important uh, topic, I think, and trend. And uh, it is uh, in, in part the result of some of the other trends. So, for example, the growth of the middle class in emerging markets. Uh, the middle class likes to have air conditioning at home. The middle class likes to have a car. Uh, they take vacations. Uh, they have bigger homes. So the carbon footprint of the middle class is much bigger than the carbon footprint of the poor. There's no question about it. My hope is that as uh, the middle class grows in places like China or India or Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that they adopt um, patterns of consumption that are more environmentally friendly. In other words, that even that in many of these places they're starting from scratch, they can actually build a middle class, they can build a market that is greener, that uses, uh, uh, you know, greener sources of energy. The problem uh, you just uh, mentioned in your question also cities is that uh, the carbon footprint really is something that uh, is uh, for the most part uh, accounted for by cities. Cities represent only 1%, occupy only 1% of the land in the world. They're home to about 70% uh, of the population right now, and that's growing. But cities contribute more than 80% of the carbon emissions in the world. Uh, oh. Cities are very energy inefficient. Um, and so we have to change the way in which our cities are growing. We need to make cities more environmentally friendly, more uh, so greener, because otherwise there's no solution to the problem of climate change. You know, there seems to me that you have so, so many important steps that you've outlined, but what type of response are you getting from business leaders who are typically used to thinking no, no longer than one quarter? So that's a great question that you're raising, Jim. Uh, are businesses willing to buy the value proposition that uh, taking action now about the environment, about global warming, is good over the long run? And uh, it is true that some businesses are still skeptical because they worry about the bottom line. They worry about uh, you know, the short term rather than the long run. But I see a, an increasing trend in terms of ESG, equity, sustainability, and governance, 
among companies everywhere in the world, uh, especially large companies. All of them now include ESG in their annual reports. And there's, uh, as you know, also increasing pressure on the part of investors. Uh, more and more people don't want to you know, invest their pension man fund money uh, in equities uh, that are linked to companies that pollute or companies that contribute big time to global warming. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing the beginning, uh, but we cannot uh, be complacent. I think it's really important for people like you and I to educate business leaders, to continue putting pressure on them, that they need to think about the long term when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to contamination, when it comes to pollution, when it comes to global warming. And you're seeing a really different approach from Generation Z than perhaps uh, our generation, aren't you? Well, apparently, uh, surveys indicate, yes, uh, that young consumers are willing to pay a little bit more for goods and services that are uh, greener. Uh, in other words, that leave behind a smaller carbon footprint. But let me tell you one thing. Uh, younger people also like cryptocurrency. And as you know, the blockchain, uh, the energy consumption of the blockchain that is uh, required to transact and verify transactions, uh, for example, for Bitcoin or any of the other cryptocurrencies, uh, is one of the biggest uh, contributions to carbon, uh, in the, uh, carbon emissions in the world, equivalent to the entire energy consumption of a country such as Denmark with uh, six or seven million people. So, so I, think, um, I think we need to continue educating also young people, although I think uh, you're right, they do have uh, good intentions about when it comes to climate change. Basically, no good deed goes unpunished is what you're saying. <laughs> Well, what I'm saying is that, um, you know, sometimes uh, we think that we have the solution, uh, for example, going digital, uh, but uh, that is also, as you know, a source of pollution uh, because we discard so many electronics equipment, as you know, every year. Uh, and that is also a source of carbon emissions because all of those digital, uh, you know, gadgets uh, require energy. Oh, thank you so much, Jim and Vince, for inviting me. I think it's extremely important uh, that we have a debate and we have a discussion and analysis about all of these trends, because uh, I think uh, that before we even think about what to do about them, we need to be aware of uh, how uh, important they are becoming and to what extent they're going to be changing our lives in the near future. The world all around us is changing very quickly. Population trends, economic trends, technological trends, they're essentially redefining our lives. The first step, if you want to be effective at adapting to the new situation, is to be aware of the extent to which our lives will change at work, as we learn new things, and also as we enjoy rest and leisure. Marlo, thanks so much for participating in part one. We're gonna see you again very shortly, where we will be talking about how to, uh, how to react to many of your suggestions. And to all of you who have been watching today's show, I wanna thank you. And remember, we're here talking about things that matter with people who care. You can always uh, catch us on our website at mcquistontv.com. We'll see you again very, very soon. Thanks again.